sorry, Alex, you have you you are mute, so we can't hear you. Uh, yeah, Alistair. So most of the session, unless we're speaking, should we remain muted? That would be better. Yeah, that would be that okay. would be better. Just remember to unmute. I had quite a few times yesterday when I yeah, I saw to, that. Um, I saw that with you yesterday. Remember, because I wanted to keep my mic off, but um, it doesn't always work. So. Uh, We've got up to 30 participants in the first minute, which is great. Welcome to everybody to this uh, Now Bali MVB webinar on revitalizing Bali. We'll be starting in about three minutes. Um, at the moment, you can see the speakers are online. So please just um, relax and wait for the whole uh, show to start. By the way, how is the weather down in Bali? Is everything okay? It's good. It's good, uh, Alistair. We had a we had an incredible uh, rain shower this morning, though. Just at about nine nine fifteen, lasted ten minutes, and that's it. So right now, it's looking pretty clear. Good. All you need is a few tourists there, but that's what we're talking about today. Trying to get some people to come back. Of course. Okay, Miranda is going to start um, our screen with our, our opening screen. And for those who are on chat, there are some chat items already coming up. From Carly, who is from Bali Buddies, I think. And from Aggie, telling everyone to look at the Q&A and put your questions in there. Can't see your screen yet, Miranda. Don't know what's happened to that. If it doesn't work, we'll start anyway when we get another few more participants and then we'll just dive into all the presentations. Uh, but I do want as many people as possible to listen to uh, Nino because he's got a great presentation. So that's why we're hanging in there because uh, people obviously, it's only 9.01 in Indonesia. That's very early. It's 9.01 in Jakarta, 10.01 in Bali, but that's still early. Okay, Miranda's trying to screen there again. By the way, for everybody who is watching, this is uh, a new a friend who can't get online because we're, we'll be at capacity. It is on YouTube Live, and we are recording this. So all of anybody who is watching and wants to, uh, has to dash off, you can get a recording later. Uh, with the permission of all the speakers, we'll send the PowerPoint presentations to anybody. We did that yesterday to all registered um, uh, participants, uh, attendees. So you will get both the recording and the PowerPoints if you wish them. So we will be more than happy to, to do that. So you don't need to worry about if you have to leave the room for any reason, uh, you will be able to catch up later. Okay, Miranda, I don't think that's working. I can't see your screen. So I think we're gonna dive into the opening now and we'll just abandon that nice picture with a, a virtual backdrop which we don't need. So I think we'll just dive into the, the uh, opening, which is gonna take me about five minutes just to uh, explain the background of what we're doing. So please allow me to share screen and perhaps uh, I can ask all of our speakers to go on mute. Okay. Good morning, everyone. This is Alistair Spears from Now Bali and MVB coming to you in this webinar on reopening, restarting, and revitalizing Bali. Uh, we've done the, the reopening and restarting uh, yesterday, which had a total of about 160 people watching and got very good um, remarks from everybody who was 
was watching. Today, we're talking about revitalizing. And revitalizing is different to reopening. Let me just go back over what we talked about yesterday to give you the background. Everyone knows that the economy of Bali depends at least 80% on tourism. So there is no short-term answer to the economic distress except reopening. But reopening and restarting are two separate issues. We can reopen hotels, but restarting depends on our source markets. That means that people in other countries, including Jakarta, let's say, need to have confidence that it is safe to come back to Bali. But how do you create confidence? Do the principal markets have an appetite for travel? Now, looking at the latest McKinsey sur uh, survey of China, they have an appetite for domestic travel, but they don't have an appetite for overseas travel yet at all. And they also have to have permission to travel, which means that the, the, the protocols between countries have to be in place. And they have to have confidence in Bali as a destination. And that's what we've been talking about yesterday, how to give them confidence to eliminate or at least minimize the doubts as to uh, their health, hygiene, safety, security, the processes and protocols and procedures. And above all, our honesty and transparency. See, we don't have a very great um, history of, of honesty and transparency and in, in information here. So we have to be very careful about that. Now, one of the things that we agreed on yesterday was to give the principal markets the certainty they want, we need to actually have certification and accreditation. It's not just good enough to say, I've deep cleaned my hotel. To what level? Who says it's free from any COVID or any other problems? Um, we want to have the highest level of international certification. And yesterday we had um, Nicola talking from Geneva, who was the head of the hotel um, section of SGS, so Société Générale de Surveillance, one of the highest level of certifiers in the world. And he told us exactly what we have to do to make sure that all venues are certified. That means certified means certainty as well. But we need to have that throughout the whole uh, supply chain, the airport, the transport, um, all complying to the same protocols. Michael Burchett yesterday took us through the things that hotels have to do to comply with that, in addition to health, hygiene, safety, and security. We also had the GSA, one of the world's top accreditation bodies on security talking, and they told us how you can get to the level where any corporate, any travel agent, any airline in the world, any government in the world would trust your security and safety as well. As I said before, we don't have a really great track record of honesty, not because we're not honest people, but we're not very good at getting information um, correctly. Right now, our COVID statistics still look very underreported compared to other countries. So if we want business to return, we must be upfront, honest, and give excellent, well-informed information daily to all key markets. Now that needs a top-level professional PR and Marcom system set up now to create the positive messages that we have to give, and we haven't done that yet. Sorry, my screen won't change. Come on. But that's not all we have to do. Those are the points to be addressed in day one, which got very very good response, but we also should take this opportunity to reinvent and revitalize Bali as well. Why? Because we can't go back into the markets and say, hey, we're back just the same as before, haven't learned a thing. No, we didn't listen to anything you said, because people have been saying things. They've been saying for years, increasing complaints about the deterioration of Bali as a destination. The waste issue hit international headlines, but traffic it's an issue. Parking is an issue. Crowds in the wrong places are an issue. Unsightly and unbalanced structures and billboards also have no, many long-term visitors saying, this isn't Bali anymore. I'm not coming back. I've heard it myself. This is a time where we can fix these things. All we need is to plan and to commit so that we do not lose our old friends and have to rely on high cost new markets. These are the only visible problems that Bali faces. The invisible are just important. Water is running out fast. 
without drastic action will bring the tourism industries to its knees again. Energy is now from all renew non-renewable sources, which means that certain markets just don't want us. Noise pollution is everywhere from so many different sources. And then there's overdevelopment, non-Balinese buildings. Basically, the island is over capacity for its roads, most of its infrastructure. You've heard it all. So we need to think again. All our speakers are dedicated, passionate, and experts in their fields. And in the order of presentation, we're going to have Sean Nino telling about his vision of a sustainable Bali. Jamal will help us to see what hotels will have to be like. So this is a mixture between what we'd like it to be like and what we have to do. And Jamal's a very experienced hotelier. He'll tell us what hotels will have to be like post-COVID as we face the new reality. Alex will take us through the steps to re-engage our teams who deliver the hospitality and who have had a hard time in so many crises. And then Susan will talk about how to reduce the quantity of our arrivals, focus on quality, and hopefully not lose profitability. That's my invitation uh, to listen over. I hope it clears the way for everyone. Um, you are now, we're now up to 72 people online and we welcome you all to this uh, MVP Now Bali presentation. The reason I'm doing this is because I've been in Bali for 40 years. I happen to have a sustainability advocacy, which is MVB. I haven't got my Now Bali credentials with me because they're all in Bali, uh, but I'll leave it to all of the other Bali-based presenters to present the things that we love about Bali and care for about Bali. So welcome to everybody. Stay online or on YouTube and listen to some great experts talking today. I'm going to pass over to Sean Nino, who many of you already know, who has created for us a very short, but very up-to-date and up on point presentation on what New Bali really should be like. Sean, are you ready? Good morning, everyone. Um, just bear with me for a second here to share my screen and to get this presentation up. Um, can you see this? I can see it, therefore everyone can. Okay. And I urge you to put your questions when you're thinking about them, put them in the Q&A box, everyone, and we'll address them when we get to them. Thank you very much, Sean, over to you. Okay, can you see the full presentation or do you see the screen that I'm seeing here? Screen and the words which are alongside, so you need to go on to uh, full screen. Okay. That's the one, better. No, you still this... not on. That's it, well done. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Um, the last past two months have been quite relaxing in a sense that we haven't been driving so much and traffic is not here. Uh, Bali has really slowed down. And I have to admit that uh, personally, I, I do appreciate um, how things have slowed down and um, uh, I feel productive at home, um, online. Our team is still productive. We're still working a full force and uh, still working on projects, uh, still helping to improve and develop properties. Um, so I wanted to share with you a few short slides that um, paint a picture of what we were doing and where we were in 2019. So by 2019, Bali's hotels, uh, the number of hotel rooms has grown to 100,000 in total. We had 5,000 hotels in Bali. We have them right now and we're building more. To put that into comparison and just to paint to uh, a picture of uh, Balinese villages, for example, there's 730 Balinese villages in Bali and 5,000 hotels. So that's round about seven to eight hotels for every village that we have in Bali. The majority of this development is found in the south. The population density is very high. We are about a thousand, over a thousand people per square kilometer. 
um, and we have very dense constructed hotel development. When you go up to the west and east coast, it's not so, um, so dense anymore. Um, and what we see is that tourism is expanding upwards into Tabanan as well as into Karangasam as the coastline is continuously being developed. And this presents us with an opportunity to really improve on things. Electricity growth on the island grows by around 10% uh, every year. And 90% of our electricity comes from coal. So we have very polluting electricity grid and uh, a high level of emissions, about one kilo of carbon emissions per kilowatt hour of electricity. Water, we are in a 13% deficit, according to the Bali Water Protection Program, uh, which works together with Polytechnic. Uh, we see uh, saltwater intrusion in the majority of southern Bali, um, where uh, hotels are, are going down as deep as 100 meters um, and uh, they're pulling up brackish saline water uh, which shows that the salt water is pushing into the freshwater aquifers from the ocean because we're extracting too much water. Now if you remember the image I showed of hotel density and if you just take a walk around Seminyak or Legian or Kuta um, you'll see how many hotels there are and imagine that every one of them has a very deep well and is sucking thousands and thousands and thousands of liters up uh, every hour. Uh, so we, we, we face a few problems here and uh, we have to start working on some solutions to do things differently. Um, now, I think that there's been some substantial efforts and we've had the Bali Clean and Green Forum. Uh, we have the Trihita Karana uh, certification and auditing team. We have EarthCheck, we have Green Globe, uh, we have TÜV. We have all kinds of different companies and efforts, associations um, that are all working on reducing the amount of resources that we consume per guest and per hotel. What we're still missing and, and what we need to find uh, moving forward is more collaboration. And we need to agree on standards. We need to agree on the same language so that we work on the same uh, things uh, and targets mainly as well. Can we reduce hotels resource consumption by 10% every year? It's physically possible. And even though it might sound ambitious to some, we can reduce the hotel industry's resource consumption by 50% in the next five years. If we make an effort, can we develop new KPIs, key performance indicators for hotel managers, for example? How can we hold people more accountable? How can we train up individuals on the property that are not the GM, that are not the chief engineer, but that are an individual eco champion, a person that is inspired and very affluent about environment, very affluent about indicators, very affluent about what is happening in Bali, and that serves as a key spokesperson within every hotel to really drive progress. We've spent almost five years uh, and we've been working on over 25 properties and we found that savings of up to 40% is, is realistic and achievable. One of the first hotels that we worked on was the Viceroy where uh, we used um, a, a mix of heat pumps, insulation um, and, and a few other measures to really drive down uh, energy consumption. And something interesting that we found in this hotel is, is that they did care and they did want to find those savings, but we tend to cash flow um, the, the resource consumption and we don't make the necessary time to really drive down the costs. Uh, the head of engineering is very busy keeping everything maintained. The GM has a lot of things on his mind. So when we came into this property and spent three months there and really dedicated our time to work with them, uh, we found them electricity savings in the realm of $100,000 per year. This is quite substantial. And 
what then happens is that this money frees up and can be reinvested into other efforts, right? So we can continue to improve on that uh, first year. Um, we work together with this beach club and we found them water savings uh, in the realm of 23.9, let's say 24 million liters saved per year. Uh, to put that into comparison, that is enough drinking water for 60,000 people for an entire year. This is the savings that we achieved at this beach club by closing uh, some leaks, by uh, setting up sub-metering stations, all, all areas of the property, so we could actually uh, find uh, where the water was going and where it was being consumed, and by implementing um, a more diligent reporting framework so that the team and management actually cared about their water consumption. Again, a very busy venue, uh, a very passionate team, but just missing some key facts and the consistency, most importantly, to actually drive uh, resource savings. Uh, we worked with this famous water park. I think everyone knows it. It's uh, Water Bombali. And we've been uh, driving um, a lot of different resource saving strategies here. Mind you that they were a platinum certified earth check. Um, they had the highest level of awards in Trihita Karana, and they generally are a very, very passionate team um, that cares about the environment. And again, it's about developing a system that is more consistent. And by nominating key staff members to become eco champions on, on site, and by establishing new benchmarks and new frameworks. Sorry, this is, just gotta close this real quick. We can find savings in the realm of 40%. It is absolutely physically possible and what I wanted to talk about today is how can we as a joint community uh, develop new standards together? How can we get on the same page about how much energy we need per room night, per guest night, per person? How much water do we need? How much waste is supposed to go to landfill? I've seen, uh, I work in the waste management sector as well. And I've seen a large decrease in trucks coming to the landfill. This is due to the hotels shutting down and the tourism industry coming uh, to a hold, basically. We've gone from 500,000 500, passengers per month uh, to less than 100,000. And the island is, is not as busy as it used to be. I would like us to find a way to reopen so that we actually keep an eye on the amount of waste going to landfill and keep an eye on the amount of water that we're consuming and keep an eye on the amount of energy that we're consuming. And I'd like to pass on to Jamal um, from the Bali Hotel Association to potentially build on that to see how we can implement that. Yesterday's presentation from Michael Birche talked a lot about credibility and trust. And Yoke was talking about a sense of community and security. And we know that Bali is Aman. We know that we are going to beat this COVID-19, but we have a lot of work to do in regards to the environment. And uh, we need to find better ways of collaboration uh, we need to define standards that we can all agree on mutually and we need to make it more relevant so that it is actually part of the discussion so that general managers actually are aware of how much resources they consume when you ask them that they actually know that right we need shareholders to care more about this too and i think um there is a lot of movement and Alistair has been doing some fantastic work in bringing together a community. Um, 
I just, yeah, we need to see where it goes from here. So I'm going to hand off my, my presentation um, to the next speaker to see how we can continue to build on that and to see how we can develop standards that actually build mutual understanding amongst us all so that we start to follow and implement them in a very consistent way. Thank you. Sean, you know, thank you very much indeed. That's absolutely excellent presentation, exactly what we wanted. Uh, concise and to the point, uh, not going over too many changes, just the ones that we have to make. Actually, they're not ones that we should make, the ones that we have to make. You see, in Indonesia, as I've been working with my MVB partners, we, we understand a couple of things now. Everyone thinks water is free, that there is no downside to water. You just pump it out of rivers or out of the ground. It's free. It's fine. We just pay for the electricity. We're okay. But that's just not true. Um, online, we have watching uh, our water expert, Didier um, Perez from PIPA, and Didier has already tried to engage with the government of Bali to come up with big water schemes, and we nearly got there. Um, in fact, uh, the governor said, let's do a pilot project, but it's now on hold. We must get it off hold again. He's now also come up with a, a really good scheme for potable water made directly on site for every hotel, so you don't actually need to buy water from any um, external source. So there's, there are solutions. Sean's brought them up right now, so we need to really um, look towards those changes that need to be made, must be made, otherwise we won't have an industry in the future. Um, we'll come back to all of the points you've made. What I don't understand is if you can show a presentation which says, I can save you $100,000 a year and save electricity, why won't everyone do that? Are you stupid? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense when you see that, you go, I'm saving energy, I'm saving water, and I'm saving money. Um, Sean, we'll come back and let you answer that later. Yep. There's, there's only so much we can do, right, as a small team and company. Um, but we can do a lot if we develop standards together. Good. I'm going to pass over to Jamal now, who's going to tell us the, the hard facts about what hotels have to do to, to post a uh, post-COVID era. Thanks uh, again to Sean Nino. I'm going to mute. Good morning, everybody. This is Jamal, Jamal Hussein. I'm going to uh, give you a short presentation. And uh, this is on behalf of the uh, Bali Hotels Association. Now, let me try to get my screen uh, up. <clears throat> I think I'm on already. You look good. Okay, Fine thank you. Lies. Yes, got it. Right. Uh, morning, everyone. And uh, again, Jamal Hussein here uh, on behalf of Bali Hotels Association. Uh, we've heard uh, from Sean about the uh, eco uh, aspects of uh, the tourism here in Bali. And uh, I'm gonna just share with you some of the hard facts hard facts about what hotels will have to do in order to gain confidence both on the uh, national level, regional level, international level, and finally on the global level. Um, why is my page... Just give me a sec. Hmm. Ah, here we go. Okay, so uh, just to kick off, uh, let's look at some of the past challenges that Bali has had. Uh, as we are all aware, Bali has had, uh, you know, two uh, pretty serious bombings. Uh, SARS has affected Bali, 9-11 has affected Bali. Uh, fair share of effect from the tsunami, earthquakes, volcano eruptions. With each of this challenge, Bali has adapted, Bali has changed. Um, a long time ago, you'd be very surprised to see security guards at the entrance of a hotel. Uh, the number of CCTVs in, uh, in usage in Bali is 
currently tremendous. Uh, K9 units, you still see remnants of them in some of the hotels here. Now, all this was the adaptation uh, to the Bali bombings. Traditionally, we always had fire drills. Uh, since the last tsunami, we even have tsunami drills. And this is just to show that uh, adaptation is a continuous thing. It's not going to stop. And today with the latest challenge of COVID-19, um, we're going to adapt again. COVID-19 for sure will bring about changes to Bali, uh, will bring about changes to the tourism industry and its people. Uh, we'll have to embrace these changes uh, if we want to carry on business. Uh, and software and hardware will both have to adapt, both have to change. Previously, there was always a question of, you know, what is more important, life or livelihood? And I guess uh, many countries, many governments had to go through that. Uh, I personally feel that it's no more a choice. It is not a decision between life and livelihood. They both will have to coexist. Uh, one without the other is not a choice. And the focus now and for the immediate future will all be about health, hygiene, safety. Coming now to hotels, the hotels will have to make significant changes, will have to embrace such changes uh, and probably move away from what we always knew to be the traditional uh, way of doing business, right? Uh, we have always prided ourselves on uh, touch points. I guess that will have to go away. The all powerful handshake, the flesh to flesh, uh, will be a thing of the past for the moment. Uh, a lot of new touches will be introduced and this will probably be non-touches as opposed to touches. Uh, basically the result of social and physical distancing. And here we have two categories of people that we are gonna be addressing. One is the employees, right? Uh, already for employees today in Bali, masks have become a way of life. Uh, many, many, many hotels are implementing very strict regulations about employees. As they come to work, there is a basin uh, at, the, uh, at the entrance to the hotel for staff and they have to wash their hands. They get a temperature check and only then uh, do they get into the hotel. Social distancing already begins in the locker rooms. Uh, there is a, a, a capacity control in the sense that, you know, we say 30 people in the locker room, the rest wait outside until, you know, five out, five in, things like that. Housekeeping staff, uh, they are eight hours a day besides their lunch or dinner breaks uh, 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 with masks and gloves. Uh, then there's, of course, distancing even in the staff restaurants. Uh, where tables of six are now becoming tables of four or tables of three, uh, and there are two meters between tables. Uh, there's extensive cleaning going on, sanitizing of frequently touched, uh, you know, tabletop areas, lift buttons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Continuous training takes place uh, on health hygiene and safety, because these are now new standards. The old standards of, you know, health hygiene and safety. Uh, doesn't apply anymore. For the guests, they will be impacted too, and in many places, right from the start, airport, airport pickup, uh, luggage handling. Um, you know, we don't know yet if uh, luggages are going to be sort of disinfected as they come out on the carousel. So, you know, probably the people who pick you up will have to have some sort of a tissue wipe down uh, with uh, alcohol on it to wipe down your luggage before picking it up, carrying it to the car. Your, your check-in, your delivery of, of luggage will all be handled differently. Uh, your rooms will probably be sealed. Uh, you could even have a little paper seal or whatever uh, at the door to, to signify that it has been, you know, desanitized, it has been cleaned. Um, that, that will be there. Uh, for, the, for the restaurants and the bars, buffets will have to be looked at. 
uh, some some restaurants might do away with I mean some hotels may do away with buffets altogether because social distancing becomes a bit difficult uh, when you have a buffet running. Restaurants and bars will have social distancing. Tables will be set further apart. Uh, even in swimming pools, wow, well, this is this is something one tends to maybe overlook at the beginning. But uh, you know, when you're swimming, you also need to 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 kind of practice social distancing. So you know, I guess posters and all that will be all around the hotel. Spa is a separate area that needs to be addressed. Public areas, of course, lots of hand sanitizers around. Uh, even the kids club, the gym, all these areas will be impacted. Let's maybe look a little bit closer as how, right. Um, here's a slide that I've just, you know, put together to show uh, a little bit more in detail about social distancing, hand sanitizers, etc. Uh, even for reservations, you know, uh, especially because in reservations, the, the online bookings don't give you a lot of uh, uh, a lot of details about the guest, right? So uh, here we'll have to sort of uh, request that even online bookings have a lot of details of the guest so that minimum number, minimum time is spent in a check-in procedure. Uh, I guess the, the, the rest of the stuff I won't read through. You can, you can look at it for yourself. Here is a special thing, uh, mice, banquets, meetings, incentive meetings, uh, you know, in the ballroom, this, this is going to take a new life of its own. Uh, first of all, I think that, you know, when business comes back, uh, mice would be pretty late in the, in the process of coming back. Uh, I guess, you know, FITs would be first, families could be next, uh, you know, but mice, I think the just the, the psychological feel of being in a big room, air conditioned, closed off uh, with, with 200 people, uh, that, that will take some time coming back. Uh, even so, hotels will have to be ready uh, with capacity control. Now a ballroom with 400 uh, may no longer uh, be able to, to, to take in that number. It could be half, 200. So, so a 500 ballroom becomes now a 200 persons ballroom. Uh, new microphone hygiene will have to be uh, will have to be dealt with. You know, I can't be having having a microphone to myself and then just passing it along. So some sort of a hygiene protocol uh, must take place. Uh, group meals will be a thing of the past. Uh, I think group meals to start off with would be takeaway boxes. Uh, coffee breaks the same. Uh, I don't think there'll be group lunches or dinners, uh, and there'll be absolute crowd control. So, you know that does bring about um, that that does bring about a lot of questions about uh, how financially viable will meetings be then for hotels. All of us have third-party vendors. You know, uh, we have. Uh, contracts signed up with transportation companies. Uh, we have, of course, suppliers. Uh, and for transportation, even uh, hotel car drivers, taxis, grab, uh, we, we have to look into, you know, what kind of sanitations are they implementing? What kind of uh, sanitization of the car, uh, whether they wear gloves, no gloves, masks, absolutely mandatory. Uh, we look at that also for our tour activity partners. Uh, all those people selling tours at the tour desk, you know, uh, we need to know what measures are they taking to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Uh, because as we are responsible for our guests, we need to be responsible also towards our partners in how they treat our guests. Overall, we, we, we need to be sure of traceability, right? Uh, guides, drivers, uh, representatives, tour and activity guests. In, in, in many ways, we need to be able to be the link towards the connectivity. Uh, if and when uh, a spread begins, one must be able to trace it from hotel to infection and, and, and then be able to provide such information to the uh, authorities. 
certification uh, very strongly spoken about yesterday already. Uh, but yes, this is a must, right? Uh, the government or a government recognized body must certify hotels as meeting the new standards. I guess, I guess first new standards have to be established. Uh, and then right after that, uh, hotels will have to com comply with these. Uh, this will be absolutely be required by business partners, whether it's travel agents, tour operators, event organizers, uh, wedding organizers, etc. A lot of new SOPs will have to be done. I'm sure many hotels already have that. Bali Hotels Association have already established a list that can be shared. Uh, I think we can also expect familiarization trips to be on the increase because more than what we, they just hear, they would like to come and see, feel, experience this, this new normal. There have been some schedules that have already been uh, shared. Uh, one of them is that the first June domestic airline travel is going to start. So uh, that would be sort of the first possible gateway to tourism. Uh, June to October, uh, the Bali government, including the tourism ministry, have put together a, a, a project. Uh, June to October, they will be uh, doing things to gain confidence. Uh, obviously, this will cover the fact that infections would be very, very low, high recovery rate, less death, strong health, safety standards firmly in place. In October onwards, they have called this project appealing. And here, uh, it underlines making Bali a desirable tourist destination under the new circumstances. Uh, and uh, they're going to highlight, of course, all the changes uh, and uh, policies, et cetera, that have been undertaken to minimize COVID-19 infection. I think mine for planning purposes. Still, plenty of unknown factors, uh, international air travel, when, how, where, uh, we don't know that yet. Uh, there has been a lot of news, uh, you know, uh, talk about Air Asia already traveling uh, nationally, uh, domestically in Thailand, uh, other airlines are preparing for travel. Uh, we don't know whether there will be rules and new laws, capacity control in hotels. Uh, if we take the airlines, for an example, there's a lot of talk about the middle seat not being utilized. Uh, just like that, there may be more rules and laws that says that in the first six months of operation, um, restaurants can only run at 50% of their registered uh, capacity. Uh, maybe hotels can only run up to 60% capacity, 60% occupancy, uh, so that social distancing, physical distancing is underlined rather than undermined. Uh, one, one, one has to also come to terms with the fact that you know, the outbound country has to be safe. Inbound country has to be safe for tourism to actually take place. Uh, let, us, let us assume that, you know, Bali is totally COVID free. Wow, fantastic. But who are we going to invite? Uh, will we be inviting the countries that are heavily hit right now with uh, COVID like uh, Spain, Italy, UK, United States, uh, France, Germany? Uh, so I think that, you know, that, that, that more is at stake, uh, not just Bali has to be safe, but all its partner countries, uh, outbound, inbound has to be safe before tourism can actually uh, come back and come back well. There's also an economic rebound to be thought about. Uh, if that doesn't happen, a tourism recovery in the foreseeable future is unlikely. Uh, the economic rebound is very, very connected with the tourism rebound. Other questions that we don't know about is also how many hotel stakeholders, tourism stakeholders, etc., will survive <coughs> this economic downturn. It is rather drastic. You know, one of the things that we 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 think about is that when this when this uh, pandemic hit out, right? A, a, a lot of people were on unpaid leave. A lot of people 
uh, had to sort of uh, consume their leave, forced leave, finish it off. So, you know, uh, if tourism appears again uh, this year, I wonder how many of people can actually travel, right? Last but not least, a, a very, very, very vital part of the puzzle, the cure, the vaccine, or the medication against COVID. Um, no one really knows. Uh, you know, we, we hear a lot of things. Uh, we hear that uh, many, many uh, vaccines are, are being developed in China, in UK, and whatnot. Now, uh, if they come up with a vaccine, you know, that would be the miracle cure, obviously. Uh, but the general opinion is, you know, uh, vaccines take 10 to 15 years uh, to be successfully developed. But sometimes, uh, sometimes shorter right now, people are looking at, you know, anything between two years to three years. So we'll see. A lot of unknown factors, uh, but one thing's for sure, it is no more a choice between life and livelihood. It is how we coexist together. And, and, and this will be crucial in the, in the first six months to a year from now. This, this would be crucial. How we live with COVID-19 and how well we are prepared to protect ourselves uh, with hygiene, safety and health factors. And that is the presentation. Any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Questions. First of all, a big thanks, Jamal. That was very comprehensive, very well thought through, very good points. Um, not as optimistic as many people listening have hoped. You're saying that it's going to take some time to get back on, which is why we had the the difference yesterday between reopening, which is easy, and restarting, which depends on our host, uh, our, our source countries, and the confidence that they have in us. The confidence that they have, as we said yesterday, depends entirely on how professionally we attack this whole uh, reopening and restarting process. Um, and yesterday we had some, some very good answers. I mean, one, one that came up yesterday was very important, was that SGS have 110 auditors trained and ready to go. You need that number of people before you can certify in the, the numbers that we need as quickly as possible. So that's part of the thing, but uh, some extremely good points that you've brought up there. Um, the whole schedule from the government uh, looks good, but it relies on us to implement it. The private sector, it's very easy for governments to make plans, uh, for, but then they say, let's do this. Well, how? Who's going to pay? What's going to be the, the KPIs of all of these factors? Um, we'll come back to questions. <clears throat> We're beginning to get some Q&A on, online, which is great. That's the best way to put your questions forward, everybody. Put them down and we'll get to them. Uh, speakers can all read them and answer directly, or we can answer um, live as we go forward. Um, I'm letting this session go longer because every point that's been made so far is important. Um, so don't go away. We have 108 people online and many more on YouTube live. These are the questions that, as you said, Jamal, our livelihoods depend on. We get them right, we may get our livelihood back sooner. Let's listen now to the, exactly the point you just brought up um, from Alex Javonovic from uh, Trans Hotel, also part of the Bali Hotels Association. Uh, Alex is once again an extremely experienced operator and one who I have seen in his motivational best on many occasions, not only with his staff, but with his guests. So we asked him if you take us through what it's going to take to get some very depressed workers back to work because the people who work in tourism are surely down and depressed at the moment, not doing anything, many of them, skilled, trained and enthusiastic and some of the most hospitable people in the world with no one to speak to. Alex, over to you to take us through your presentation, please. Right, thanks a lot, Alistair. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. We can hear you. We can't see your presentation yet, though. Not yet. 
I'm just sharing it now. Okay, can you see if you've got the full screen on that yet, Alistair? Uh, no, it's still got your thumbnails on the side. Go for it. Go to okay, just that go little to. button there should work it. No, it hasn't. Got some okay. more. <laughs> got some <laughs> One second. Let's get this one to the correct size, I think. Hang on. Bear with us. I might need some technical support. Alex, uh, do, you have, do you have two screens? Yes. That uh, I pulled out the cable and, and that made it work. <laughs> yeah, I, I did that earlier, actually. How are we going now, guys? That looks good. good. Thanks, Alex. Over to you. All right. Look, I, I think the first... Uh, thing I want to say is to is probably touch a little bit on yesterday's session, Alistair. I think it was really well received. It was very informative. And I understood where you were coming from and the panellists in terms of reopen, restart and revitalise, because that's talking from the hotel level right through the marketing conditions uh, of, of opening Bali again to, to all our markets. Uh, however, in my case, for my session today, uh, Thank you for this opportunity. Steps to re-engage our team who deliver the hospitality. For me, uh, if I use those three words, I would probably say, and I think uh, both Michael Boshe and also Carla uh, did touch on it yesterday, that actually reopening the hotel, so I'm talking hotel specific, since that is my remit today, talking about re-engaging the team. So actually reopening the hotel from scratch is going to be a lot harder than those hotels that are currently open. So that would, where those current hotels where they're currently open would fit more into the restart mode. So I just wanna use that as, as, a, as a way of beginning this presentation, because remember, uh, emotional attachment builds loyalty. And if you don't have the staff around in a, because you're talking about reopening or restarting, in restarting, you have your employees who are cleaning and doing things, and, you can sort of start training. So that's a very important part for anyone who's listening today, uh, whether it be a restaurant, your hotel, your business, it is going to be easier the sooner to sort of restart. Now, I know there's a cost factor and there's a lot of hesitation because everyone's thinking maybe July rather than June is the more healthier um, sort of business levels, particularly the domestic market that we all know that, we all know that we're chasing. So let me reinforce that it is your responsibility uh, to reopen or restart as soon as possible in order to excite your teams. So now I wanna talk about how do we start to excite our teams? So the best way to begin is create an ideal working environment for your team. And uh, th this is a, a, a very conventional approach uh, that I think many of you probably already know, particularly the GMs and the training managers and so forth. But let me, let me take you through these steps. The first one is referred to as teamwork. So in order to maximize productivity, teamwork and collaboration are the principles of a great workplace. The team and its productivity, and more important, the individual's input. These are very strong measures, and it's team members who collaborate and celebrate those achievements that they know that the work of the team outweighs the individual needs. So the second point is what I refer to as cooperation. And cooperation a little bit coexists with creativity. Now we all know that a great workplace is open to positive change and encourages creativity and new ideas. Employees feel empowered to bring ideas and new ways of operations to management. And we've all seen that. And we know that the team members actually like freedom and to be somewhat creative and tend to take ownership in this type of work. The third point or the third step is trust. And this is very important because trust is similar to fairness. You know, undoubtedly hard work is recognized and rewarded at a great workplace. Problems that arise can be addressed. Considerations are given to all parties. 
and there are clear communication paths that are open for concerns as well as grievances to be aired, aired and tackled. So now my next step, and this one I really love, and I think, you know, particularly from a hotelier's perspective, clarity. Clarity is very similar to communication. Clear, concise, and consistent communication is vital at all levels at the workplace. From top-down approach right through, effective communication skills are held in the highest regard, and we all know that. And that helps the employees to learn quickly, resolve difficulties, respect one another, and furthermore, introduce new ideas. So now we move to the last of the conventional steps, if you like, uh, and this one is my favourite, fun. Fun or enthusiasm, whatever term you want to call, but for me it's fun. A healthy and positive workplace strives to get gets its employees into meaningful work. And people who are enthusiastic actually are more invested in getting the job done, and they tend to reflect their enthusiasm in their work conduct. And, and lastly, what's important about this point is that the customers recognise and reward the energy of these employees and in turn will make the companies more profitable. And lastly, what I think is important is that the employees, when they have fun and this energy arises, that they will get compliments from the guest directly, either a guest comment card or even TripAdvisor. So that takes us through the conventional steps of creating an ideal working environment for your team. And what I'm gonna show you in this video is a very short video of a more conventional approach that we did pre-COVID with our own team members, which probably touched a little bit on the trust side that we allowed our team member to speak up. We gave them a few questions from our HR department, and this is what we would like to share with you. Not seen anything yet, Alex. Okay, just uh, video videos. They're so easy on PowerPoint, but screen. How about now, Alistair? Celebrating uh, Women's Day 10 years ago, is that it? We can't hear it though. Can you see that video? I can see it, but I can't hear it. Can't hear it. You just summarize. We've seen your your um, your team working there and having meetings. Just summarize what they had to say, Alex. Uh, you oh, they, they, did you see the subtitles, Alistair? Or yes, not? we did. Yes, subtitles. Yeah, I think look, I think we'll just leave it at that. It was really just giving the team members a chance to open up and to talk what they felt was the truth, uh, how they felt with regards to certain. Uh, humanistic questions that we were really asking about their workplace. Um, so anyway, hopefully in the, uh, for the presentation later, that, that will be on there. So let me move to now the, the more non-conventional approach to uh, a better uh, work environment. Just one second, because this one should give you all a little smile on your face, I hope if we get the screen right. Not yet, still the two screens. Not yet, no. two screens again, okay. Whatever you did before, do it again. Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying our hardest. Okay, how are we going now? It's still the small and the thumbnails, but I would continue at that point just if we can see it. 
in the way uh, but, but it's not the screen though, right? Not on the Avengers screen. Well, we can see that, but... Well, actually, I don't know if you can see the Avengers screen because that's where... Okay, not let's... Yet. Okay, that's, that's the screen I want you to see, but it's small, is it? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Go down to it anyway, Alex. We think we can all see it. Okay. Okay. So what, what you see here is... Um, no, you're still on your opening, your opening oh. screen. We haven't gone down to Avengers yet. Oh. Ah, got it. Okay. But not Great. on full screen, right? Yes, it's on full screen. It's perfect. Oh, perfect. Okay. All right. So I apologize for that technical glitch. So here we are looking at a more uh, non-conventional approach. So what we did is um, we, we wanted to uh, create, I, I mean, I, I just maybe put this in perspective. We created a theme, a fun theme, in order to take us through a series of campaigns while our hotel uh, was 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 as it is. It's still open, obviously. So we took the the movie of Avengers and we superimposed our face. I think you can see me there as Captain America and Iron Man is my resort manager on the right, Marius. And it was his idea to come up this idea, but it, it had a significant difference uh, because I just went through the series of teamwork and cooperation, trust and clarity, etc. But here is a not a, a not so conventional approach uh, attributes. Uh, which refers more to giving the pause uh, rather than contributing. The dream pers personifies the dishwasher who probably wants to be a manager one day. It's very important to have that that belief. And Im and the imagination is 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 you know again more the fun and and what is the theme that we're doing. And and if this works well and you get your employees uh, re-engaged, uh, you can get great rewards. And this is what I'm going to show you uh, now moving forward with the rest of my slides. So if you see this slide, we're looking at the brainstorm ideas and, and, and training is really important to mention right now because even the hotel is open, even we have limited inventory of rooms that we're selling, we have staff that are, have lost a lot of their great skill, uh, their confidence levels have dropped. And so we are, we're training them with some of the new hygiene and, and all of those sort of procedures. But at the same time, we're trying to get them to be creative and think, what, what campaign can we do in order to bring more revenue into the hotel? So we went through a, 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 actually three series of brainstorm ideas, including training, in order to get the team excited and to create I, I do, still an ideal working condition, even though the hotel was, was more or less closed except for, except for our villas. So think about this, your staff are, are rusty. Uh, some of their colleagues that they worked with are no longer with them. So you've got limited manpower, you're trying to be creative, you're cleaning, you're cleaning the pool, you're doing a lot of other duties that you didn't do before. So there's a lot of work when it comes to this particular phase. So again, as I re emphasized at the beginning, reopening hotels will face this challenge, particularly those hotels who probably had to, had to you know, dismiss their staff and they're gonna, go, they're gonna have to go through a whole recruitment process and a new training process. Now the next slide, phase two, this is what I refer to as, as fundamental services. So here are the examples that I just spoke about, temperature checks, cleaning that we didn't do, the masks that are on, the, the food preparation areas, uh, really intense cross-training, multi-skilling in different areas that they probably didn't work in, uh, et cetera. So this, this fundamental exercise is critical. Employed, and, and Jamal touched on a lot of those fundamentals. We don't know how we're going to really run these hotels. We don't know what sort of... Uh, systems we're going to have to adapt to the new norm. So this is a process that really is going to be uh, very, very important over the next, what I see, particularly the next four weeks. So we move to the next slide. And this was, uh, this was the, the phase three of this whole process. So the brainstorm phase one, uh, training, and then, and then the fundamental uh, practices. So now we move into the actual campaign stage. 
So this was part, this was the first campaign and all the message was very clear. We just wanted to tell the world that we're open. And we are also taking precautionary measures against COVID. So we did a video, which we'll see at the end of my presentation. But as you'll notice, we went from email footers, we went through to e-flyers, we went through email messages, EDM blasts. So we really used our own database, mainly in social media. And that's why I emphasize marketing campaign and communication content is critically important when you are re energizing your team because they need to know what is the clear message that you're trying to do. So what we did at, at our hotel, we wanted to make sure that we want the whole world to know that we are open and our staff to feel confident that by saying that statement, we have a chance to bring revenue into the hotel. So now we move into the, the fourth phase, which is the uh, what we did the campaign, which is called Stay the Hotel Aja. Again, we, we mock it around with this a little bit because of the international stay at home symbol. So we played on that. We, we went from 200 room inventory hotel. We closed all our, our wings. We closed off all our chillers. We, we um, uh, closed all our outlets down. We just had room service available and we opened our 16 villas that are standalone villas. So we thought they were ideal as a self quarantine option. And, and we were really excited. If we, if we could have filled the villas, the 16 villas, that would be enough revenue to keep us open, to keep us self-funded for each month. Unfortunately, we were not able to capitalize the occupancy that we wanted with those 16 villas. We got to about 50%, but that certainly wasn't going to be enough uh, to keep the hotel uh, open. So again, it was still helpful that we had media partners that were still supporting us through this process. So, you know, so we went through sort of campaign one, staying open. We then went to campaign two by trying to fill our villas, which we weren't quite point, which is really important. And this was the third, if you like, the third part of our campaign. And this was the advanced purchase voucher, which all the hotels are doing. We, we changed our, our strategy. We did another brainstorm. We said, how can we be different to the other hotels saying, you know, um, uh, pay now, stay later. So we went a little bit emotional and we said, look, purchase now and make a difference. What's, what's going to make a difference? The difference is you're going to keep our staff in a job. We're going to keep the hotel open. We need to sell these vouchers. But we were very specific in the way that we marketed and we went straight to a lot of the return Australian guests that we have, uh, fortunately, over the last five years. And so we created this unique message. We put the photos of our staff that many of them would have seen and we mainly went through um, our own database through something that I'll share with you in a moment. But really amazing what was the success of this particular voucher. Now, with everything you do when you, when you re-energize your team, think of a target too. So they've got to have a bit of fun. They've got to have the teamwork. They've got to have the collaboration. They've got to have the clear message of communication. But they do need a target. So we set a target. We said, let's involve. We had 450 employees before COVID. Today, we have 230, and, and from that, we gave each of them, even the lowest level employee, we said, you've got to sell one voucher. One voucher is a minimum of two nights, and we worked out a figure. The 500 million would give us enough to pay half salaries and to pay our, our electricity bill. And this was such an amazing thing because what we found here, all the processes of the conventional and the non-conventional, so the conventional was the teamwork, the collaboration, the cooperation, the ideas, the clarity, the consistency, where the non-conventional was more the attributes, the purpose, the dream, you know, really knowing that we could stay open. And then there was the fun element, which was the trans venture and the theme. So now I'm gonna show you some, a slide that I think is very interesting, particularly for you, Alistair, and for the media people. And this is, this is an international survey. So what you see here is during the last two and a half months of this disruption, social media of all channels increased considerably. But the one that increased the most or, or was the most used was WhatsApp. And, and look, I was really amazed when, I, when, I, when this statistic was shared with me uh, and it came through our head office in Jakarta and I loved it because it was part of the, also because they're studying a lot of the millennial approach and that. But I was so happy because the success of our campaign, most of our vouchers were sold because we were using WhatsApp, myself, my managers, that WhatsApp personalized, customized message, say, please, you know, 
help us out, help us, you know, it was really amazing. And 50% of our entire workforce sold at least one voucher. And our, our end result was, was a lot more than the target that we had uh, originally set. So now I'm gonna just show you the proof of this Transvengers WhatsApp. So for the next slide, you'll see, there's the Transvengers and you'll really see the level of engagement. Creating the WhatsApp group to encourage and to go congratulate our team was a real benchmark of success. So every day it was like, are we gonna hit this amount? Uh, who's the first one to sell? Oh, by the way, congratulations. And we had a, a electronic payment system. So from the time you sent the, the message to your, to your return guest, you could literally get a response, send a link and get payment within an hour. That's how powerful this tool was. Alex, this is great. We need you to wrap up now to stick to- Now this is, this is where I'm wrapping it up. Next slide. And funny enough, you said wrap up and there's the wrap up. So this is something that Jokke taught me. Don't, don't say, don't use any as conclude. A wrap up is lovely. So Jokke, if you're listening, I'm wrapping up. So in the wrap up, what is the wrap up? Make sure that everyone of your team have a specific role and responsibility, but work towards that collective goal, work towards that teamwork. Getting the job done well, but to reflect that enthusiasm. Guests will recognise and reward that energy with compliments, such as TripAdvisor, as I previously mentioned. And if you need to, create a new culture. If you feel that you need to re-energise or reinvent or whatever you've got to do to, to get this new uh, feeling going on, then even create a new culture if you need. And this is very important. Right? We heard the session yesterday, our partners, we hopefully work with in the future, whether it's now Bali, uh, SGS, uh, um, uh, GSA, uh, we've, we, we personally will work with um, our cleaning company, um, Diversity, I'm thinking of working with a hospital like BIMC to give us some international flair. So working with partners and getting them involved is really important, just as we are doing with our associations like Bali Association, our tourism. All of this is very important that we work together for that same common goal of what we're trying to achieve. And that's why I think what you've done, Alice, is very, very important over these two sessions, these two days. So my final words, Get ready to re-engage your team. You need to reinvent yourself and you need to get invigorated. Thank you very much. There is, a, there is a video, which is our hygiene video. It's a one minute video, if I have time to show that, Alistair. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Alex. Uh, let's hope the video works. Um, if you can engage it now and see if it does. Um, if, while you're starting, oh, maybe. Thank you. Excellent, Alex, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd like to check in immediately and get your fantastic service in your villas, because I know you've still got eight of them which are unoccupied. Thank you very much. But the, the whole message you gave us there of re-energizing your team, very inspiring. You've given us away all of your secrets of your marketing, which is very kind of you. We appreciate that very much. Jamal's team have already started their campaign based on that, uh, which is fantastic. Now, before we go on to Susan, um, I have got something that we would like to show you as well. I'm afraid there is no such thing as a free lunch. We've had a bit of trends advertising. We're going to have a little bit of Now Bali advertising. Miranda, please play our video, if you don't mind. <laughs> Thank you.
that's it. It just shows that this has been organized by now Bali and by MVB. Our last speaker, um, and we'll come back to the questions. The questions are piling up in the Q&A box. Um, some very good ones which would like to be answered live, especially so that people can hear them rather than just uh, communicating with the question, uh, person posing the question. But let's go on to Susan. Susan Santos is a, a passionate uh, uh, ca capacity um, uh, oriented uh, uh, international tourism specialist looking at how to make tourism quality not quantity and that's what we've asked her to talk about today sustainable tourism is her passion um, and she is going to tell us something which i fully believe in which is quality over quantity susan the floor is yours You have to unmute first, please, Susan. Sorry. You're still on mute. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you. I am so happy and delighted to be with all the experts and um, all uh, the, the, fan the our speakers who actually also share my passion about sustainable tourism, quality tourism, and um, engaging all the pri public and private sectors in um, sustainability. So without further ado, may I start our, my presentation? Please do, Susan. So um, can you see that? Not yet, there's usually a bit of a lag though, so don't worry. Just oh. as long as you've gone share screen, it should work. Hold on, hold on. Now I'm the one having the technical start the share. Can you see that now? Yes, it's working. All right. You need to go on to the full screen if you can. The full screen. Because that's got, so got the thumbnails. There you go. Yes. Well done. Thank you very much. Where you go. So um, quality tourism, I had been advocating for this ever since, even the way before COVID and, and all the, the um, calamities and, uh, and even all the natural disasters or environmental disasters that we have and we're facing. That's why um, I had been advocating sustainability ever since um, with my personal experience from uh, Peru which um, I was fortunate to have. And uh, also when we were based in Japan, where we had a lot of also of calamities, earthquakes, tsunami, and what have you. And um, still very passionate about climate change and environmental risks. And now we are facing with another um, health and safety risk, and which has really devastated the whole tourism industry and not just and, uh, without any exemption. So my topic is in fact, um, which I had been sharing since before was the quality tourism, spreading tourism in space and time. But now with the safety and health measures that we need to observe all the more that we have to do this. So this um, overly Instagram uh, photos wherein we see crowds would be a thing of the past really. So um, here in Indonesia, it, we are very lucky in fact that by law, the, the, the tourism uh, ministry has already adopted the global sustainable tourism standards, which has its own um, indicators and uh, supposedly adopted by all the destinations, not just Bali. And um, this had been um, enacted by law. And we are, I am a representative of Green Destinations, which is also a cert, uh, an accredited certifying body by the GSTC. And we have already the standards in place and with the certification in place, but we need to do, the, to do this step by step. Step by step is meaning, first is engaging the public and private sector to adopt and implement the standards. So we have the six themes from the Green Destination Standards, which are in line with the global sustainable tourism standards. We, the, the 
with the core value also of the genuine and authentic, responsible and respectful, economically sustainable environment and climate, nature and scenery. This is also applicable not only to the destinations or local communities or big cities or other uh, host communities, but also to private estates. We now have the, the uh, standards, private estates meaning resorts or hotels that are located in their own destination. So we also um, not just uh, engage people with the standards, but also we give rec recognition who are doing this step by step. And in fact, we have launched already for, for uh, the third year now, the top sustainable 100 destinations. And uh, we're happy to, to share that uh, there are four finalists from Bali. They're all, uh, sorry, from Indonesia and two from Bali. And they're all uh, community-based uh, tourism wherein um, they have success stories. And um, this is really has to still to be managed uh, and controlled because the problem with the uh, uh, emerging destinations is that they get too popular, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. So now we need really to um, engage not only the private sector, and I'm happy to, to see that uh, Nino has shared uh, very uh, good uh, rewards from the standards, uh, for example, the savings, economic, and then also the environmental aspects as well as also the um, with also the the economically viable, which means um, there's there's a you invest a little, but also you have still um, profitable from the savings. So here with the quality tourism, we need to engage not just the private sector, but also it's a whole government of approach now, including. Uh, tourism ministry, um, health ministry, the interior and local government, transport, labor, rural development, vocational schools, and university with tourism programs. We need to engage them all already. It's not just up to the hotel owner or the, the private sector to do this. We, uh, the, uh, the private sector, they already know because they need to reopen and to restart and they know the measures, but what about the rest of the community? What about the ones, the public spaces that is not uh, managed by the private sector? So also this needs to be addressed. It's a whole government approach. Just as an example, after, uh, here in the af aftermath of the COVID, or we're still in the COVID situation in fact, and we will be in the next uh, probably two years, is that um, I'm happy to share that we in Thailand, where the, in they're going to adapt the green destination standards and already adopted the, also the global sustainable tourism council standards, is that immediately in the amidst the COVID situation and their lockdown, they together with all the uh, administration of the Ministry of Tourism, the Public Health Convention and Exhibition Bureau, the Board of Trade of Thailand, their Federation of Thai Spa and Wellness, the Retailers Association, the Hotels Association, Association of Domestic Travel, Amusement, Leisure Parks, Restaurants, and the Spa, and even the Boats, and also the Event Management Association, together they convened and adopted their uh, Safety and Health Administration Certification. And um, right away, they're ready to open because all together, the private sector and the public sector work together on this. On the other hand, in Spain, uh, there's also the, the Institute of Quality, uh, the, the Institute for Quality Tourism also um, already uh, proposed their um, measures, um, uh, anti-COVID measures, um, not only for, but uh, not only for the public, but also for the private sector, to include um, lodging, uh, restaurants, and ecotourism, adventure tourism, even, and uh, archaeological sites and heritage sites. 
So this, all this must be considered, not just the private sector, but also the public sector. Of course, the private sector plays a very um, important role because we are the ones delivering the services. So trade associations, I'm happy to see that the Bali Hotel Association are already into it, going into the measures and then accommodations, happy to see that uh, Trans Hotel are doing it already and um, are all engaging all, all their uh, employees in it. Transport and excursion operators have to be engaged also and with the proper prot protocols and standards and uh, sellers and packagers, tour operators need also this, including the tour guides. The tour guides who are the ones leading now, uh, I would say the, the tour groups, big tour groups will be a thing of the past, no more massive tours, but probably individual distance groups, private tours like that, but still tour guides and interpreters will still need uh, to have a role in this, especially in managing and also in interpreting the micro destinations and attractions. And then also, of course, um, local uh, producers of um, the, the tourism industry need also to, to be engaged in this. So we do still, now we, do, we have to admit that producing or avoiding uh, overcrowding requires the good visitor management practices that includes the safe and healthy protocols, strand transport management. Somebody already put a question, what about the roads? You know, what about the traffic? What about the vehicles, pedestrians, bicycles? In Jakarta, they just soft open. And before you know it, Sudirman is again a traffic gridlock. I mean, what is the protocol there? Slow travel concept, we have to promote pedestrian zones, slow food, longer stays, and then the time of day and seasonal pricing, we already have, we know that the hotels and um, airlines are now uh, selling, pre-selling vouchers with open dated stays and open dated um, flights. So this is good because we need to revive the economy. We need to revive the tourism industry with this, but it is also good to spread them in seasonal, in time and space for in order to avoid the crowds and in order to still to observe the protocols. We have to develop and promote other nearby attractions to disperse the crowds. So again, spreading tourism in time and space. The carrying capacity in anti COVID, of course, well, now it, it will even be more reduced. Nature will be very, very happy with us because um, due to COVID, of course, uh, you know, the animals and all the, the biodiversity are thriving because of less uh, people, uh, uh, less impact on it. So still, we still do need to do the visitor contact with physical features of both the cultural and natural heritage, still to observe visitor satisfaction, and, and then of course, respect the residents' attitudes. With, of course, still the safety, health, uh, measures in place. Again, um, target marketing. Uh, Bali is really a place wherein we used to just target, you know, thousands of visitors per day, but short stay, you know. I mean, um, the Nusa Pineda is like that, oh, hundreds and hundreds of, of visitors for only a few seconds of Instagram. I mean, what is that? So now we have to rethink this. Who's going to visit the islands? How are we going to manage it? But still, we need to already rethink, repackage everything that will still be very, very economically viable, even with the reduced um, maximum capacity. Again, the value of safe, healthy, and longer experiential stays, we need to focus already on this uh, seriously because. Um, Bali is a year-round um, destination, but um, a lot of people still go, well, for example, this uh, Lebaran, supposed to be the Jakartans all over there. And, and in fact, for the past three years, I, I don't like to go to Bali in Lebaran because <laughs> it's like Jakarta <laughs> with the traffic. 
but now we have already again spread the the tourism in in space and in time and um, uh, ponder on more uh, longer stays uh, business the business travel will still definitely be um, steady and uh, in fact the leisure travel will take a little bit of back seat but business travel will have to go on so we still need to do and rethink about mice as well because uh, we have venues but we have we have we need to have to do still the events but on a sustainable way much more now with the impact of the, the safety and health. So um, yes, we have to rethink also uh, longer stays and especially mice. So my takeaways from this, or your takeaways from this is rather that safe and healthy administration must be in place. It is not just by the private sector alone. We, has, we have to engage multi-sector and national agencies concerned. This has to be in place. The sustainability standards are still very essential in order to respect the, the volume of less volume of visitors and to deliver the quality experience. And then visitor management techniques and involve also many government agencies, especially you know, the, the public spaces, the public, the highways and the roads. And then of course, we need to practice target marketing and strategic development to attract quality longer stay vi uh, visitors and visitor behavior will also be changed and it can be managed when we say that they have to sanitize, wear gloves, et cetera, then they will comply. But again, self safety and health protocols will also in incur some um, not so friendly uh, amenities like the masks and gloves and the plastics Again, we have to rethink this, re reuse, reduce, recycle in this. How we do that, we still need to establish that later on. Uh, thankfully, even just in the household, we need also to, to minimize our plastics and the use of the disposable masks and gloves. So we have to rethink that also. And then of course, support local, buy local and sustainable purchasing to support uh, sustainable consumption. We need to again revive our farms, organic farming, local farmers, we need so that, you know, the carbon, um, carb, low carbon emission and impact will be also observed as well while supporting the local economy. That's it for me. If any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for the Fantastic, Susan. Thank you very much indeed. You said actually over the four speakers today, we have said exactly what I would like to have heard. What we need to do, how we need to do it, what we need to focus on. Um, we know the answers. Why can't we do it? That's the question. Why can't we do it now? And there is no reason why we can't do it. Um, there's uh, as I said yesterday, the, in the, the new national budget allocations, Nusa Dua has been given $33 million as a capital injection. Uh, they have been nominated as the pilot project for the, the reopening of Bali. They've got the money that should happen immediately. I mean, literally next week we should be starting if we want to get on with it. Uh, but uh, Indonesia has always had enough money. It's how it's used it that we need to focus on now. Is it going to be used for the right um, purposes as we reopen the most important industry and the most important destination for tourism in Indonesia, which is our whole tourism industry in Bali? We've got quite a number of questions going out. I think some of our um, uh, speakers have already, already read them. The first one was to Pat Jamal and Sean about um, uh, about um, uh, from Didier Perez, did you read that? Um, the, the fact that destinations will only be considered by future, a certain sector of future tourists as if they're sustainable. How do we prove sustainability in Bali? 
That's really the question that comes down to it. We can't just, as Yoga said yesterday, we can't just make it up. Hey, come back to Bali, it's sustainable. We actually have to do it. And that means managing the water, managing the waste, managing the energy, managing the traffic, managing the cars, managing the pollution. We actually have to do it. Tomorrow we'll start, if you don't mind, with you and say, look, can the Bali Hotels Association have sustainable standards that they have to comply with to be a member? Is that something that's feasible? So we actually say, let's start with the Bali Hotels Association and the CETA Travel Agents and the Parks Association. You can't be a member if you're not sustainable. Sorry. How about that? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> couldn't agree more, uh, Alistair. I think that these challenges have been prevalent here in, uh, in Bali for a long time. This is not new. Uh, those of us who are familiar and intimate with Bali know that. And we are very aware how detrimental these factors can be for tourism. Uh, you know, Bali has always had challenges with water, with waste management, uh, and other very important ecological stuff along these lines. Uh, we are constantly in dialogue uh, with the government authorities. We are in dialogue with our fellow members of which we are about 160 hotels. And we all chip away at these problems. Uh, I'm sure Sean will be able to uh, you know, give us a little bit more insight about this, I guess, from an ecological point of view, he would be better qualified to pass comments. But I wanted to make sure that, you know, our viewers understand that this is something that is very close to our hearts. For long term tourism to be sustained, uh, these are basic issues that have to be at some point handled very seriously. The, the dilemma is, of course, how can we be, on one hand, be one of the top 10 destinations in the world, and on the other hand, we don't have enough water? How does that work? You know, uh, on one hand, we are the top 10 tourist destinations in the world, and on the other hand, uh, we have waste management challenges. How does that work? So at some point, uh, you know, transparency will allow these things to surface. And when that does, the world may perceive us to be different than what we are trying to portray ourselves as. And, and that becomes a very tricky situation. And before I take too much time, I, I'd like to pass it over to Sean, who I'm sure can shed more light into this. Thank you. On, please pick that up. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, Jamal, you're absolutely right. There has been substantial progress, movements, associations. Uh, th there, there is good motivation, but energy, water, waste, air quality, all are common resources. And the problem we all face is that no one is directly responsible for them. The impacts also are indirect, so we don't immediately feel them, but we just kind of continue taking care of our own businesses and our common resources are continuously depleting. So we do need to look into policy. We do need to look into what the Balinese, Balinese villages provide us because they, in the end, are the ones that implement the policy, right? So as every hotel is part of a Balinese village, there needs to be more collaboration on waste, on energy, on air quality, on transportation mobility, in order to regulate uh, the impact that the tourism is having on that village. Uh, there's a great opportunity to do this in the West and the East Coast. If we look at Kuta, Legian, uh, Nusa Dua, these areas are all a little bit harder, um, but not impossible, right? There are standards in place. We know that we cannot consume 8,000 liters of water per guest 
per night, right? That is something that is 30 times more than a Balinese household would consume. This is not sustainable. And it doesn't need to be this way. We can provide five-star luxury. We can provide all of the amenities that create the top-notch experiences that Bali wants to present to its clients, but we can do it in a way with much less resources. And I think all of us know that this is possible, but it has to be at the top of our agenda. It has to be consistent. So we need to have those KPIs in our management decks. We need to have standards, procedures, and we need to have people that are responsible, more importantly. Every organization, hotel, enterprise needs to have a dedicated person <clears throat> that is literate, that has a high level of environmental literacy, and that is a spokesperson for his her hotel or her hotel. Uh, and this has to be implemented across all of our hotels and all of our assets on the island. Uh, may I answer also part of that, please? Alistair? Susan, dive in. Yeah. Um, um, there is the private sector. Um, we at Green Destinations, we are qualifying and in fact advising and coaching uh, public destinations, which are managed by local government units, which are managed by communities, uh, which are managed by, not by the, the public, uh, sorry, hotel owners or resort owners. So we have also the standards and we are also certifying. And in fact, we are recognizing um, destinations, small um, communities. Uh, that's why we had two finalists from Pemoteran and the other one from, I forgot the name. And it's a village in Bali. So you see, um, it's, uh, there is the private sector standards that uh, Sean is already, they are already doing. And we also have the, uh, local government unit manage destinations, small communities, towns, cities that can be, uh, that can adopt the green destination standards and certification for that matter. So yes, it should be a public and also a private um, endeavor. Um, Susan, thank you. That's, couldn't agree more. One of the things that we've analyzed over the last few years of, of, of working in MVP is the fact that there is no ministry of sustainability in Indonesia. That responsibility is spread out through different ministries, including the environment, the forestry, the Ministry of Maritime Affairs, many different ministries. And so the, the coordination at a national level is very difficult. And it comes down to a local level. You have the government of Bali, which would be a natural place for it to be the provincial government, but that's not, doesn't seem to be as, as uh, powerful as the Kabu patents. And the Kabu patents then have their own ideas. So you've got these three levels already, which makes coordination difficult. And as Sean has just said, uh, you know, if you don't work at a village level in Bali, you get nothing done. So that's four levels, um, national policy, provincial policy, Kabu patent, and village level implementation. So we do have a challenge with the government to try and find the right engagement. And that time right now, and the best place to do it is in Bali, because you are defined by the shores of Bali. It is a province with distinct um, uh, limits. So I think this is a very good opportunity to, to take this on and ask the government to be um, an interface. Uh, Alex and, and Jamal, as the Bali Hotels Association, uh, we don't have anyone representing the travel trade today. We had uh, Carla from Panorama yesterday, but do BHA have an interface with the local governments that you can start to have that cooperation on a positive uh, sense? Uh, Alex or Jamal, please. Yeah, certainly, Alistair, uh, we do have, uh, you know, the board members of the Bali Hotels Association. There, there is one person who is in charge of uh, the environment, uh, and he's also the person who liaises with local authorities uh, on, on such issues as environment, CSR, uh, you know, along those lines. So yes, just like the Bali Hotels Association would have one person who is uh, in charge of security, one in charge of marketing, like uh, for example, JC, uh, he would represent the Bali Hotels Association in terms of marketing, uh, et cetera. So yes, we do have. 
And yes, whenever such issues become a challenge, this is brought up with the authorities. Uh, and then our usual line would be Bali Hotels Association, often also PHRI, which is the Indonesian Hotels Association. And of course, also the local authorities here, as well as the Ministry of Tourism. Yes. Do we see that engagement happening now? Jamal, to have a single unit, I'd like, I'd like to see Bali tourism community with the same SOPs, the same expertise, the same timeline. Um, all of my speakers can answer this. The Bali government has set these, these timelines, June to October, October onwards. Are those feasible? We talked yesterday about not having timelines, but achievement thresholds. You have to be certified before we open. You have to follow the SOPs before you open. You have to do the right things before you open, rather than putting um, uh, timelines there. What, what, what does anyone think? I'm open to all contributors. We, we do have dialogue with the government on these issues. As you very well know, and as most people who are you know, well-versed with Bali knows that uh, the, the very difficult thing here is, of course, to coordinate all these things, right? Uh, the best efforts are made. And as we trudge along these lines, uh, hopefully we will make uh, progress. The government has, for example, it has set together a couple of things. July the 1st, domestic travel begins, right? So now we have to see how that impacts uh, Bali. Uh, they have said July, July, June, uh, sorry, 1st of June. So June until October, uh, it's going to be, you know, to prepare uh, for what's to come. Uh, we, are, we have yet to see what those plans exactly entail, but obviously people like, uh, people in the business of the hospitality, the hotels, Bali Hotels Association, uh, we will all cooperate to make this happen. Guarantees, difficult uh, to be able to predict exactly, again, difficult. But we are very happy to know that there are plans for progress uh, in these issues, Alistair. And, and I'm quite confident that we will be moving ahead step by step over the next few months. Tourism is absolutely vital to the existence of Bali. And I'm sure that alone uh, justifies the seriousness with which everyone is dealing with this current pandemic. Thank you. And I think that everyone is, is very serious about it, but being serious and having the right solutions are two different things. By the way, I forgot to show my second video. Miranda, do you mind? Because I, I'd just like to, to, to introduce you to what we've been doing for the past five years, which is our MVB movement, which Alex has been part of. Uh, Sean and Susan have spoken frequently about bringing sustainability to all businesses, which benefit everybody in a time of crisis. So here's our quick video on MVB. MVB has the only sustainability dedicated magazine, I think, anywhere in the world now available online. All we do is talk about sustainability and how important it is um, in our lives. Um, I'm going to ask everyone, uh, if you've looked at your Q&A, there are still a couple of questions that haven't been answered. Um, uh, one from Eddie to Susan. Nino shared at the start 
a map of Bali's development concentrated in the south? Is it better to keep the other areas protected from mass tourism or to develop them? Excellent question, Eddie. One which no one really wants to answer because people want to develop the north to help the prosperity of the north, but they want to protect the north and keep it the way it is. Susan, have you got any other examples yeah. of how that fact, works? Um, Ecotourism will be the way to go now for the moment especially with uh, ecotourism means in fact less uh, less impact low impact uh, conserving the the environment protecting the the local community within so therefore it's actually uh, from my experience personal experience it is the way to go quality tourism is basically ecotourism and uh, that's where you also get higher yields in fact and uh, that's tested and proven in peru where I, where I came from. And also in the Philippines, we do the community-based tourism, wherein also uh, communities are engaged, but in a low impact way. So, you know, they go to river rafting or, or you know, or caving or something like that, but still in a very sustainable way with all the conservation and sustainability practices in place. Uh, all over Asia, because we have the Asian Ecotourism Network, we are in fact promoting these already post COVID and um, that's the way to go. Um, no more mass tourism and, and, and big events with all the, the rage, uh, rave parties and all that. So um, yes, we can still do that. And in fact, that is exactly the point of spreading tourism in space and time. That's very good. So in fact, yes, let's give the rest of Bali tourism, but in a controlled measured way, not the same as we've done it in the South. Very good answer indeed, and I couldn't agree with you more. That comes back to regulation though, and it comes back to the control over the development. When you put a 500 room multi-story hotel in the middle of rice fields, you can't really call it ecotourism, even though it's called the green friendly forest hotel. No. It isn't, um, no. and that's often what goes wrong. Um, Another point that, uh, from Sean to everybody, which is really important and getting more important by the day, all of the bio waste from the masks and the hazard gear is actually has to be incinerated. So during this whole period where we've got more and more people wearing masks, you can't just throw them out because they are actually biohazard waste. I don't know if anyone's thought about that. Everybody out there now, please dispose of your masks, anything else that you use, very, very carefully indeed, because at the moment you can't just put it out to the dumps. Um, and I don't think the private use, Sean, is going to be looked after at all. As we've got 10 minutes, we've got two minutes more for each person to wrap up. Alex, um, there's a question to you saying, okay, the, the process of COVID will continue for some time. How are you going to keep your teams motivated? What are you going, we going to do about the people who have been this very uh, nice word, furloughed, which means sent home without any money mostly. How are we going to get them back to work and how are we going to keep the people on half salary and 10% guests motivated for another two or three months at least? Yeah, look, it's a million dollar question at the moment and uh, I, I wish I had the perfect answer, but um, there's a lot of obstacles that we still have to face. Um, we need to do a lot more brainstorming and that comes at the individual level uh, and hopefully shared with more seminars like this with experts that can help us to bring information back to the hotels, keep our teams informed, communicate, uh, keep them positive, uh, keep the hotel clean, get them doing jobs, multi-skill jobs, gardening, cleaning pools, stuff that you normally wouldn't have done uh, because if the hotels have been so busy, there's a lot of cleaning and, and updating that actually team members can do. Uh, so it's saving money on bringing labor later as well. Uh, painting, back of house areas, you know, you'll be surprised all the uh, archives and documents that can all be sorted out. But do it, as I said earlier, keep the team enthusiastic, get the team spirit going, and you've got to lead by example. I think, has anyone got any solutions for the people who are, just aren't working? Uh, because Bali has probably got the greatest proportion of people out of work because tourism has been hit the hardest. Um, a lot of people are still working from home in Jakarta. A lot of people are still in the small mom and pop operations are still working full stop. But in Bali, people have just been sent home. Um, what to do with them? I, I know we can't answer that now, but it's, it's a big, it's 
a big concern for me. Um, final point from uh, Jamal, then Susan, and we're going to finish up with, with um, Sean. Jamal, thoughts? What are, we, what are we going to do to make this happen? Um, do we have the commitment from BHA to make the changes, to make it go ahead? And is there a, a, a interaction with the rest of the industry and with the government that we can see and feel immediately? Definitely, <clears throat> Alistair, uh, Bali Hotels Association is totally committed uh, towards these changes. New SOPs have been drafted, have been approved. SOPs have been shared with the government. We want to make sure that, that all the parties are on the same page, whether it's the airlines, whether it's a tourism body, uh, you know, whether it's the authorities here, that everybody understands that we are prepared to integrate the challenges that we have now with the COVID-19 with the ways of doing our business. Our business hasn't changed. Just the way we are doing it has changed. And, and, and there must be facts uh, and figures to support the mitigation of the spread uh, or potential spread of this uh, pandemic. And, and hotels are extremely, extremely uh, willing to cooperate. Obviously, it's our lifeline. And uh, we understand that tourism, as we understood it, uh, is, is now changed uh, for a while. And uh, so, yes, we have prepared ourselves for the changes. Uh, we have put in steps to assure our clients uh, understand that safety, hygiene, health, very, very high up as a priority. And hopefully this message can be very, very clearly transparently communicated to all the business partners worldwide so that the confidence level again in Bali begins to rise. And, and as such then begins the, the trickling of tourism back to Bali. For sure, Alistair, that commitment is uh, very clear. Fantastic. Um, one of the questions that came up in what you've just done, that confidence is actually a country to country confidence, like a bubble. If New Zealand or Australia or Japan says we are confident in Bali, you meet our standards, that channel will open up. And if we're confident in Japan or Australia or New Zealand, um, we can open those channels and have a bubble to bubble tourism, which could probably help the way in which we open things up. Um, Susan, final thoughts. What's your dream for us over the next six months? How are we going to attack this? Well, we have to also um, bear in mind that from these webinars, we really have to work together to engage both the local and the national agencies, multi-sector. We have to be together in this. We should, my, my final word is in fact, you know, we, we should never let a crisis go to waste. So let's work together to put the safety and health uh, measures in place, engaging the multi-sector and national agencies concerned. We need to do together the sustainability standards essential with our, the indicators. As I've said, we work with local communities. We work with local government units that has to work in partner with the private sector who are doing their own thing. We also need to have the alternative community livelihood. One, one community that I work with in the Philippines are doing organic farming while solving the crisis of the, the ecological solid waste management. They are also have to, because tour guides have, have no uh, income right now, but they do low, uh, organic farming. And from there they have their own food. And also they also uh, do barter among them and uh, still uh, have some kind of livelihood. So also, um, let's avoid already, uh, as I said, uh, mass tourism by practice the target mar marketing, strategic development of uh, marketing to attract quality, longer stay visitors that will be spread out in time and uh, will, which will be definitely more profitable. Thank you, Susan. In fact, the, the Bali Tourism Summit I spoke at 50, no, 20 years ago, I used exactly your example of quality against quantity, the amount spent by 
longer stay, higher value visitors actually is more, uh, gives more to the economy than the shorter stay, low value tourists. So Bali has to become high quality, low volume, and it will still be as economically viable as it is now, um, and more so, and a much better place to visit. Sean, you're part of this whole um, uh, new Bali movement, being um, partly Balinese and loving your country and loving your island and having developed systems which help them. What's your hope for the next six months, a year? How are we going to, how are you going to be part to make this, to make this whole thing happen? Thanks. Um, thank you, Alistair. I personally feel that too little people are too or have too much responsibility over too much of the environmental question. When we look back to January when the forest fires were raging in Australia, for example, the entire population, the entire country depended on a very little number of uh, firefighters and people that were actually putting out the fire. How can we motivate more people? How can we create participatory systems that we partake in, that we shape together because we are all responsible and we need to find and improve. We need to improve our systems design, the existing systems designs that we have. We need to keep working on integrating that, making it more relevant for the local community. Uh, we need to keep building bridges between the international and the local community. There needs to be better forms of communication. There needs to be systems designs that's consistent, right? That carries on until 2030, 2040. And we just need to keep working on improving, um, but also making more people responsible. I think really, really that's the, the bottom line. The economy is going to recover. It has shrunk and the adjustments are going to be brutal for all of us, but we will overcome this period and we will continue. And once we do, we're going to be facing an environmental crisis again. So uh, it's, it's, it's looming and it's, it's very prevalent. Um, once this is all over, we're gonna be right back in that same trot of this very, very, very relevant climate emergency. So uh, let's keep working on it and let's be more responsible, make more people responsible uh, so that we can solve these big challenges together. Thanks, Sean. Fantastic. Um, you know, there are three ways of making people do things. One is government legislation. Secondly is social pressure through the internet and social media. And thirdly is because people learn and understand and want to do it. Obviously, we want to start with the last one so because then they do it from the heart. But if we have to resort to legislation, so be it. If you, when, if, if you want to go to Palau, you can't take any sunscreen with you. The rules say no sunscreen because it affects the coral. You can't go swimming with sunscreen on because it will kill the coral. When you go to Bhutan, you have to sign the pledge, I will behave. Well, maybe it's time for this sort of legislation to come into Bali. You want to come to Bali, you have to behave. You have to look after culture. You have to do the things that we say you have to do. It's a great experience, but you have to qualify to be here. Sometimes we have to be brutal to make things happen. But I think that we need to have every venue to be certified as being um, both sustainable and environmentally uh, sustainable and um, safe for tourism. We need everything to be done at the highest possible levels. Yesterday we talked about certification. It's available, let's do it now. We talked about safety. It's available, do it now. We talk about protocols, they're in place, let's do them now. But let's make sure everybody does them, as Sean said. And if you don't want to do them, sorry, you're not in business. It's just got to be that critical. On behalf of, we're finished right now, I'm afraid. So on behalf of MPB and now Bali, I'd like to thank my absolutely expert speakers, Alex Jovanovic, Jamal Hussein, Susan Santos, and Sean Nino for bringing to us the new Bali, the things that we want to do, the things that we have to do, and they're pretty much the same.
we have to do them all. Thank you all very much for being with us and to the many people who have listened to this today, absolutely be with us, help us make this one community, one action, one future. Today and yesterday have given the answers. I hope somebody's listening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you Lisa. Cheers. Our pleasure, our pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you, fantastic. Bye. Keep working. Thank you, and you too. Bye for now, everyone. Thanks so much again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.